Hi, I'm Megan Latella reporting to you from the Rockridge Report. With me now is Jennifer Hughes, the Lexington City Arborist. Jennifer was hired as a city arborist in 2012, and prior to moving to Virginia, she lived in Mill Valley, California. Thank you for being with us, Jennifer. Thanks for inviting me, Megan. Of course. Um, so I just wanted to start off, what's the best part of this job for you, or why do you love being a city arborist? Um, well, I've, I've always been a tree nerd. Um, it wouldn't matter geographically where, where I was, I think I'd be doing the exact same thing. Um, I have to say my, my personal favorite part is, um, besides you know just what I am doing, is working with heavy equipment and chainsaws and the guys in Lexington Public Works because it's like a uh, SNL reunion yeah. every day, but, <laughs> but getting stuff done, constructive, great. but great, great energy. Great. Yeah. Um, and so I know when we had talked earlier, um, you told me about how your anthropology background and your degree kind of led you to this position eventually. Yes. So can you talk about maybe how anthropology plays into this job specifically or your um, background? Well, it's always, you got to like digging in the dirt, right. baseline. Um, but certainly the, the use of plants and, and the way that, that plants have been um, utilized, incorporated into our, our urban canopy, um, just the timeline of seeds and different things because you have ships, um, different peoples coming over, different animals that, that, and ruminants that can carry seeds in their bodies. Um, so you have this whole influx of plants in this timeline and when you look at the onset of the Industrial Revolution, that's when you see just this blast of diversification. Um, not only with f uh, plants, but with animals too, which is can be a good thing and or a bad thing when when you look at some of the the insects specifically um, and the diseases that they carried in their dirty little mouth parts um, that have affected our urban forest so much. So that that passion for history and that that I guess empathetic side that you have that this. Um, sensitivity to humans mm -hmm. uh, really plays into my job um, and I, I think it, it gives me a little bit of a, an edge over some other people to come at it from, from that standpoint. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, do, you, do you think you could elaborate a little bit on kind of the insects you just mentioned and how maybe they are negatively affecting, if at all, this particular area, maybe what people can do to kind of watch out for that or protect their gardens and personal properties from these types of oh, insects. Oh, absolutely, yeah. absolutely. <laughs> um, and it's one funny thing about um, being an arborist or mm -hmm. getting into trees is you, you have these little niches that you start to fall into, whether it's you know diseases, maybe plant pathology is something that, that really gets you motivated. Um, with my dad, who was, was also a forester, it was birds, mm -hmm. ornithology became um, a huge passion of his. Me, it's been insects, little creepy crawly things. Yeah. Um, you know, and I, what's been impressed upon me um, is the overuse of chemicals. Mm. Um, you know, and there's, there's a very sordid, wonderful history about, about um, specifically the, the Scott Corporation and lawn care and, you know, how that's affected our microorganisms. But, um, it's, it's such a, a vast topic. Uh, one thing that we need to be watchful for now, uh, especially now, uh, is emerald ash borer, okay. which has been confirmed over the summer in the northernmost part of Shenandoah National Park up near Harbors Ferry, mm -hmm. West Virginia. Um, they've recently made a leap, not only from ash trees, but it's confirmed now they're eating our native fringe trees. Um, little bug shipping crate from Asia. Um, you know, we, we have other borers, but this one didn't naturally evolve. Um, we're, we're working on a, on a, a natural control for it, but, um, you know, monitoring your plants. If you see a lot of woodpecker activity up in, way up in the canopy of your ash tree, and you'll see bald patches on the tree itself. Um, woodpeckers have been hunting insects for 30 million years so they're a lot more adept at it than I am and they, they woodpeckers can give you a lot of telltale signs um, and there are other insects that we don't need to worry about like aphids 
you know, if you need to spray with soapy water, if you need to take some, some sticky tape and put them on a plant and get them off, that's fine. But, but you know, using a systemic or, or something a lot more coarse, um, it, it really impacts your microorganisms um, and, and your soil. So, you know, maybe it is best if your hemlock tree is really suffering and is suffering from hemlock woolly adelgid instead of using imidacloprid on it um, or some of the different oils, maybe it would be okay to replace it with something sustainable. Mm -hmm. um, depending on where you are, what your finances are, but just knowing where to, where to draw that line. Okay. So. Um, and also, I know a couple of weeks ago, we did a story about invasive plants in the area. So it's kind of segueing into that topic. I'm wondering if you could just share with us your thoughts and kind of what the city does um, to try to combat the invasive problem in this area and then what people could do on their own time to really just kind of, A, combat the problem, but also you mentioned um, planting natives is one way to yeah. still get the aesthetic effects you, uh, that you want in your garden, but while working against the problem. Well, so that's, that's funny because we were, we were just talking about that um, when, when I was working for the National Park Service. Uh, you know, they're, they're using federal money mm -hmm. to, to maintain these parks and everyone's screaming budget problems, budget problems, not enough money, and it really is the truth. I'm not saying there aren't ways that it could be spent differently, you know, I'm not even going politics, mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> that's why I work with trees. But. Um, <laughs> You know, I, it was impressed upon me that, and just what I experienced firsthand, that, that citizens are going to be responsible for um, ensuring the survival of some of these native plants, that the federal government just doesn't have the resources mm -hmm. um, to do it. And I'd, I would never advocate ninja digging or stealing plants, seed collecting, hey, but it's going to be up to the resident, the, the private plant collector, to um, you know ensure that a lot of these more threatened wildflowers, shrubs, trees um, are safe. And I think we can do that through um, the private sector and in our own homes and gardens. Um, and we have so many wonderful groups here um, in Lexington that, that promote and educate on native plants. So what the city, what's the most effective way, role for the city to take, um, and I, I support and, and have kind of shaped this, this mindset is not, we're about sustainability and biodiversity in our urban canopy first and foremost. Mm -hmm. um, best tree for that spot, that's gonna be the most cost effective. But our focus is not planting invasives. Um, there's going to be several links that I'm actually going to send to our IT department to put up on our city website um, of plants you shouldn't buy. And the consumers, we, we have such power, like we, we can choose not to buy these plants. And whether you like plants or not, no one goes into business to not make money. Mm -hmm. So if we stop buying the barberries, if we stop buying the miscanthus and the penicetums, if we stop buying the burning bushes, um, the, the Cleveland pear tree, if we stop buying this stuff, the vinca, mm -hmm. the English ivy, they're gonna stop growing it. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't matter who started it, where it came from, you know, where it was popular, if, if we just take control of that and that's one of the things that I'm trying to do in this city is um, by not only by example which that grass behind the sign is gone mm -hmm. um, but but also through education and that's one of the services that I offer is going out and doing assessments mm -hmm. on properties and mostly of trees but sometimes we talk about the ivy that's on the tree or we talk about you know the front bed of the house and oh I see you have a barberry you know up front and it's just making that sacrifice so we can rebirth this city um, in a much more sustainable, cost-effective um, way. Mm -hmm. So we, we can have the budgets that we want. Right. Um. Um, and you, you just mentioned education um, as a way to help this problem. And before when we were talking, you were talking about how Boxerwood, which is a local 
Nature Center and Conservatory is kind of trying to work with kids. So would you say that maybe Boxwood is trying to tackle the problem early, or what do you think they're trying to do in terms of education with uh, children and invasives? Reaching the kids is number one. Um, I think giving people with this, I, I like to say that people in Lexington have tree rabies. Mm -hmm. I mean, they, they are just trees, which is wonderful, <clears throat> but I mean, it can be a good thing and a bad thing mm -hmm. um, at times. But it gives them this outlet to, to reach out to these kids and, and to educate. And I mean, I wouldn't be doing what I was doing had it not been for what was impressed upon me, the, the nature walks growing up as a, in school, um, a, like having an actual naturalist come in and, and take us on walks and, and talk to us about different plants, and that was from kindergarten up through fifth grade, having a father that was a park ranger, um, growing up inside Mirror Woods, being exposed to the people that I was, and instilling this sense of environmental stewardship um, and facilitating this emotional connection. Kids get it. Mm. And through kids, I've seen adults get it. So, I mean, you know, the kids really, it's so important um, to hit them with the, the interpretive side of it and the education, because they're gonna understand things and be okay with things that adults won't necessarily be receptive to. Right. So. Would you say, um, or I guess now, could you share with us some of the native plants that you think would make good substitutes? Um, just if you have any recommendations for people who are looking to, you know, maybe they are listening to what you're saying and they want to respond to the message that maybe we should stop planting invasives. So what sort of native plants would you suggest would make good, you know, aesthetic plants for someone's garden? Um, and there are some plants, too, that I would, I would recommend, at least for the Lexington area, mm -hmm. curbing our enthusiasm on right now. Okay. Um, certainly the ash tree, which is um, Fraxinus, is the, the genus on that. Don't plant any of those right now. Um, fringe trees, uh, Chiananthus virginicus, we, we want to watch because they, they could be a food source. Mm -hmm. Um, Lexington has a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful population of maples, anything in the Acer genus. So, you know, if you have to have a maple, you have to have a maple, but I would encourage everyone to look at different options. Um, another one is our native dogwood. Right now we have a, we have a convalescent population of dogwoods and they're when a tree gets to a certain point, they start to put off a, a distress hormone. Um, and a little stress is good for plants, animals, everything, but when they're diseased or when there's something major going on, it's almost like a neon eat it Joe's sign mm -hmm. that starts happening. And that's what the insects are supposed to do, mm -hmm. you know, and hear people spraying them and everything. I'm like, no, they're doing their job, man. They're just, ah, they're trying to work there. Mm -hmm. And we're seeing a, um, a surge in Discula anthracnose, which is a, um, a fungus that overwinters specifically in old dogwood leaves. So if you, if you have an old dogwood that suffers from this, clean the leaves out and get rid of them. Don't recycle them, put them in a garbage bag, get rid of them, um, and also borer. Mm -hmm. So if we can just hold off, I think we're, we're probably 10 to 15 years out with replanting more native dogwoods, but right now, eh. Some great trees. Um, would be our hornbeams, uh, both the European, um, the the Ostyra, uh, Virginiana, uh, the Carpinus Caroliniana are two native trees that are just kick butt awesome, and they're not too big. They're going to top out 25 to 30 feet tall. Um, that's a wonderful one. Magnolia Virginiana, the Sweet Bay Magnolia, <gasps> heaven. Um, it's, they're two down in Jordan's Point Park. Okay. There was a big sycamore over by the athletic field that we had to take out. And then these two just fierce, sassy little evergreen trees with long leaves. And they get the most phenomenal smelling flower um, on them. But that would be a good one. Um, some of your shadier areas, we have witch hazel, 
is one that's highly underused, that's awesome, that gets a flower over the winter, and mm -hmm. mine's blooming right now. So it's like, life, yeah. <laughs> you know, there's life right. in my yard. <laughs> um, but that's, that's a terrific one. Uh, some of your cultivated eastern red cedars, um, they're not gonna reseed like the totally native ones right. do. <laughs> Tough tree, nasty little evergreen mm -hmm. tree. Um, that would be a good one. I would encourage people if they're gonna plant oaks to plant the, the oaks in the white family right now because we do have a problem with bacterial leaf scorch. Um, so any oaks in the black or the red family, right now I would kind of put it to the back mm -hmm. of the bus. Um, a lot of our viburnums are, are pretty cool shrubs, tough shrubs that you can use. Um, there's just there's a slew of things. Bald cypress, kick butt deciduous evergreen. Um, you know, they're just there's so many. And and like I said, I'm here too. That you can give me a call and say, hey, I have this hole in my yard, or this is my situation. What would you suggest? So I can get very right. specific right. Um, with plants um, and and help people out. Um, Black gums are, are a great tree, a good substitute for maples. So you'll get that good color. And there's so many cool trees. Oh. <laughs> and you had said that Lexington, or people in Lexington love their trees, so I yes. feel like they would definitely jump at this information if it's readily available, which you say anyone can call you and. Yeah, yeah. and there's some really rare trees if people are looking for like cucumber magnolias. Mm -hmm. Um, if you ever go up on Providence, not Providence Hill, um, behind Overlook and Overhill Drive, okay. behind Waddell, mm -hmm. as you get around the circle um, on the far side, there's this magnolia that has leaves like that. I mean, it, I can't tell you the guys in public works were like, what kind of tree is that? You know, what is that right. tree? It's a cucumber magnolia, and we mm -hmm. don't have a lot of them. but. If you're interested in trees and you're looking for weird ones and you're trying to find natives, another another hat I wear is purchasing and sourcing plant material. Right. Not only for the city, but I, I have a, a couple other places that I work too. So I, I know where the weird stuff is. I can point people in that direction. Yeah. Um, some of them are more expensive. Right. Um, but if that's the way you want to go, like I, I am here and in full support of sustainability. Great. So, Good to know. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. You've been, well, I had a lot of great insights, and um, I'm sure everyone was going to find what you had to say very interesting and very helpful. I know. I'm sorry forward. if I was a little verbally incontinent. No, I just no. get, I get so excited. Good. No, it's good to be passionate about what you do. Very. Thank you so much. Very. Thank you. You're terrific welcome. to be here. You're welcome. Well, for the Rockbridge Report, again, I'm Megan Latella. Thanks for joining us.